It was 1999, I was 20 years old, and I was about to make a decision that would absolutely horrify my parents, <laughs> delight me, and cast me into a world of risk that would shape the rest of my life. The dot-com hype was reaching a crescendo around me, and this voice in my head was saying not to waste the next couple years in school, but to get out there into the game. So even though I was on a full academic scholarship, I dropped out of college to help start ZoomCulture.com, which was a video-sharing social network five years before YouTube and MySpace. It was a good idea, but too early. So fast forward a couple years, the dot-com bubbles burst, and we've proceeded to blow $12 million of other people's money. <laughs> Looking back, this epic failure didn't feel like an end, but a beginning. And all I could think about was how I could take what we had learned and actually create something that would be really meaningful in the world. I'd always been fascinated with renewable energy, and I was incredibly frustrated seeing the destruction of the environment from burning of fossil fuels, and I wanted to be part of the solution. So along with two of my closest friends, we started our second company, Renewable Choice Energy. We believe that given the choice, people would be willing to pay more for clean wind generated electricity. But this was October of 2001. We had just had the attacks of 9-11, the market was tanking, and we were headed to war. So imagine me, at 23, sitting in offices of men two to three times my age, trying to convince them to not only invest in wind energy, which was new and unproven, but to pay a premium during a recession. People thought we were absolutely crazy, and many folks told us that it was the worst idea they'd ever heard. <laughs> Somehow, we were able to find the first few early adopters, and over the next few years, gathered enough clients and be got our first Fortune 500. We helped Whole Foods Market go 100% wind powered across the entire country for all their stores. <laughs> While we were ahead of our time for internet video, it seemed with renewables we were just right. And I was about to have a front row seat to one of the largest paradigm shifts of my lifetime. Wind became cost competitive with fossil fuels, and what had once seemed impossible was now happening. Renewable energy started exploding across the country. And it wasn't just our market and our role in it that grew. Everything about renewables got bigger. Wind turbines started as small experimental projects to becoming some of the largest and most sophisticated machines on the planet. They now have a wingspan wider than a 747. They're taller than the Statue of Liberty. And although the blades are as long as two semi-trucks, they're light enough to be picked up by two people. Wind farms went from small couple turbine projects to now sometimes spanning thousands of acres. And the same thing happened with solar. Just in the last couple of years, we now have solar projects that reach to the horizon. It's not that we don't have challenges, there's plenty of them. Transmission is a huge issue, there's new competition from gas fracking, ever-changing policy. But there's no denying that renewables have passed the tipping point and they're here to stay. Let me tell you why. Ten years ago, only 1% of our new power getting built in this country was from wind. Last year, it was 50%. Here in Hawaii, you're one of 30 states that actually have requirements for a minimum amount of renewables. In Maui, in 2011, you built as much solar as you had in the prior 10 years combined. And today, you have the highest per capita wind and solar of anywhere in the country. <laughs> 10 years ago, there wasn't a single company buying wind power, and today my team alone sells to over 50 of the Fortune 500. The conversation today within big companies isn't if they should use renewables, but how much and which type. So you would think that being part of this whole renewable revolution would have filled my desire to make a difference. Just a few months ago, my company earned our industry's highest recognition, the Green Power Supplier of the Year Award. But Despite all the success and the change we'd seen, there was still something missing for me. What I realized is that the bigger that renewables got, the less connected I felt with the impact. When a huge wind farm goes online, the grid gets cleaner, but no one even notices. 
my logical brain was telling me I was making a difference, but my heart didn't see a difference in anyone's lives. Even when I put solar on my own home, turned on the same lights and appliances, nothing in my experience had changed. So I was left with this haunting question. Am I doing enough? Am I really helping anyone? I sat with this question heavy in my heart until I had a life-changing moment at the world-renowned Unreasonable Institute. <laughs> I was mentoring other socially-minded entrepreneurs. I was actually sitting in an audience, just like you, when Juan Rodriguez took the stage. He plunged us into this experience. As I heard his voice describing that a billion and a half people don't have electricity, not even a light, and two million people just in Guatemala live in complete darkness. I was heartbroken to realize that these families, after working 12 long hours in corn and coffee fields, could only afford one hour's worth of candlelight. In complete darkness like this, imagine trying to cook a meal for your family or take care of a newborn. Imagine spending time with your loved ones and your family without even being able to see their faces. With family incomes at $3 a day, the situation seemed hopeless. I was frustrated and saddened for all these forgotten families until the lights came up and I saw Juan standing beside what looked like the smallest solar panel I'd ever seen. It was only 10 watts. This entrepreneur had realized that if you make the system small enough, it could actually be cheaper than candles. In Guatemala, families spend $16 a month on candles. They could go solar for 12. Forget about competing with fossil fuels. In Guatemala, solar is cheaper than candles. So now every family, no matter how far from the grid, no matter how poor, could have light. After seeing solar projects that spanned acres, this tiny system is the last thing I thought would be a solution to one of our largest global challenges. I was thrilled to be partnered with Juan to mentor him at the Institute, and I had a great time visiting him in Guatemala from a trip I just returned a few days ago. We traveled to a small community far from the grid and met Gabrielle, who's in the center of this picture. I got a chance to see firsthand how families like his were living. Before his solar panel, they had three candles to share between 10 people. Gabriel had made the difficult choice to educate himself, perhaps his only way out of poverty. And yet he told me he could not do his homework because he literally could not see the letters on the page. And it struck me that not having electricity isn't about inconvenience, it's about lack of opportunity. Now his family has four hours of light every night and their lives are forever changed. And while it would take 170,000 of these miniature systems to equal the output of one large wind turbine, the changes to lives are dramatic. Going from this to this, from this to this. Juan's company has already installed 3,000 systems in his first two years. He's creating jobs in every community with commission opportunities for friends to share with their neighbors. He's got an immediate plan for the next 30,000 systems and a goal of a million homes in the next five years. When I realized what Juan had accomplished, I knew that my big search was finally over because I'd actually found where renewable energy was making a direct impact in people's lives. I'm sure you've all seen this picture, the world at night. When I look at this now, I don't see all the areas of light, but instead, the areas without it. Pretending that these poorest among us don't want or somehow don't deserve electricity, when electricity is so tied to personal and national prosperity, is like denying them a basic human right. And if they follow our path to fossil fuels, we've only magnified the problems of environmental destruction and pollution and energy shortages. 
by mobilizing millions of communities around the globe to leapfrog directly to renewables, we can at least point the way towards the end of poverty. Because there is no path to global prosperity that doesn't, at its core, involve access to clean, abundant, and affordable electricity for absolutely everyone. I believe that is our greatest global challenge and our greatest opportunity over the next 10 years. While it's been an honor to be at the forefront of renewables getting bigger for the last decade, I now know it is an even greater honor to focus on helping renewables get smaller over the next decade. <laughs> If everyone in the world, developed and developing nations, can choose renewables over fossil fuel, If we make that choice at home and support entrepreneurs like Juan around the world, if we unite together as a global community, then we can create the prosperous, clean, and equitable future that we all desire and deserve. Thank you. Mm, thank you.